Good morning, everybody. With the lovely rain falling down, it's great to see people coming in on foot and in every possible way. We're going to get going soon. And uh, I just want to say maybe there's a group of guys who had a t-shirt printed this week. Somebody decided to try and captivate some of the people. So if everybody with a t-shirt with printing on can come stand here with me, maybe. And let the people read us and see whether they think these are accurate statements or words. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite one. <laughs> yes. 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 So read the shirts. Um, there's still many others, I think, as well. But thank you to a generous person. My wife is walking around with one as well. It says, let's rock. Got something to do. Hello, Gareth and co family. Let's pray. Just to, as my friends stand here with me. Father, we thank you that you have an incredible sense of humor. You know us so well, Father, and even just a few words on t-shirts, but there's something of a heart that you have for us as a family, and you know each and every one of us so well. You know the hairs on our head, you formed us in our mother's womb, and I pray for that personal touch this morning, Father. As we prayed in the pre-service prayer meeting, we sensed and we prayed for our hearts to be prepared, the soil of our hearts to be prepared for what you want to do in and through this time with you. From worship to the word to fellowship. And we just say thank you, Father, for who you are. We love you. We thank you for the rain that is falling. And we say thank you that you've taken us beyond day zero. And in fact, there will never be a day zero with you because you are not bankrupt. In your kingdom, there's always an overflow of everything we need. So we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. A few more t-shirts popped up. So before we start worship, I'm going to do the announcements later. There's two testimonies. If Elvis is in the house, I don't see him, so it might just be one testimony. Is Elvis in the house? Okay, so get Elvis ready. But Jeremy Sibachen, Jeremy and Marlene, I don't know if Marlene's going to join you. I see they've got matching shirts. You can come so long, I believe. You've got a testimony to share? They've just come back from Sierra Leone. They did some ministry on a ship. Uh, and you know what God has called this couple to. So we're very excited to hear. I've just heard some of the stories, but Jeremy will maybe pick just one to encourage us with before we worship. All right. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I want to teach you a Sierra Leonean greeting. Are you ready? This is how they greet. How the body. And then you've got to say, the body fine. The body good. All right, so let's try it again. How the body. All right, now if I want to know how it's going at home with you, if everything's okay, I say, how the pot boil? And you say, the, the pot boil fine. And that means everything's okay at home. We had such a wonderful time in Sierra Leone. We can't explain just how friendly, how wonderful the people are there. They speak Creole, which is a version of English. Um, but there's also about 10 other different languages. It's 80% Muslim people. So we had an incredible week with 23 people we were training. Some of them were pastors. Others were just people in churches. Um, tw in the end, we realized 15 of them were previously Muslim and were being trained by us. And our whole focus was training them on how to reach out to their Muslim neighbors and friends. Marlene, over to you. We also, we actually stayed on a ship, um, the Operation Mobilization ship. You might have visited it here a few years ago, the Logos. Um, so we, we um, did a kind of in cooperation with them, but we also trained the young people on the ship uh, because they are coming from very kind of churchy environments. They don't know how to do when it's unreached at your doorstep. So we trained them how to find open people and how to start discovery groups with them. So we had a fantastic time on the ship. Just, I think the Lord's doing something on that ship because they're going ship to ship now and ship to street now. So we're looking forward to hearing testimonies. One of the amazing guys at our training was a guy called Emmanuel. He's got 150 churches under him. And he said to me about five times, I had no time to come here. I never come to these training things. I'm too much of a big shot. But I knew 
God needed me to come here. He didn't say it in those words, but that was the meaning. I mean, when you're leading 150 churches, you don't go to some little training somewhere. And uh, God just told him he's got to be at the training. And after the first day, he said, I wish I'd heard this stuff 10 years ago. And so he's gone, he's planning to train and mobilize his 150 guys in how to reach out to the Muslim neighbors, how to reach out to their Muslim friends. And I'm, I want to just say the one thing that astounded us was finally I saw with my own eyes an African church that is able, ready, and willing to be missional and reach into the rest of Africa on behalf of Jesus. And that is something we can praise the Lord for. I want to tell you about one of the young men on the training, uh, Timothy. Um, he is actually from a Muslim background, but most of the guys from Muslim background whom we trained kind of came to Jesus in an unusual way. There was either a dream or a miracle, some unusual way. And then what happened was they got extracted from their communities. So they kind of just blended in with the Christian church, but they were basically lost to their communities. Um, and Timothy, during the training, we, we did quite a bit of discovery Bible study um, because it's just such an important tool when you want to reach out and help new people discover Jesus. So we did it four days as practice. So the first day, Timothy's action step was, look, I feel so burdened about my dad, but I'm very scared of him. I'm fearful of my dad. He's not somebody you just talk to, but um, he's a strong Muslim. But I just feel like the Lord, my obedience step is the Lord says to me, I must go and talk to my dad. We came back the next day and said, yo, he just didn't manage. Um, he just didn't manage. And we did the study again. Obedience step again. He said, the Lord is really telling me I have to go and talk to my dad, but he's scared. And we're praying for him. But that day we also talked about ways that you can connect better with Muslim people that's not offensive or extracting. And he went and he came back the next day beaming. And he said to me, he calls me Grandma Marlene. I don't know what, I don't have gray at the moment. But <laughs> he says, Grandma Marlene, you won't believe what happened. I told my dad this story. And it's like he knew the story. He says, you know, I really like Jesus. And as they talked, he realized many, many, many years ago, his dad had actually um, given his life to Jesus. But the peer pressure from his friends was so strong that he went back. And he'd never learned how to relate to his son. So his son never knew this. And this started them on a path. And he said to his son, can we please keep reading? And I know we're in constant contact with Timothy online. He keeps reading with his dad. He's so excited. He started Discovery Bible Studies with many people already. He went back to the ship to try and help the young people to really go out and reach the unreached. So it's just amazing what God can do. We are called Joy to the Nations. And I don't think God is confused. So Adrian set up a whole process. They did this with Ugandan leaders a few weeks ago, a month ago, him, Dita, and they trained guys in Kenya for a whole day. They had an online training session for leaders in Kenya. So uh, Bill Lusk was part of that. Dita, Carl Stone, who else, Adrian? Sid Rothman and many others. So reaching the nations even when we are sort of locked down. That's amazing, huh? Okay, the one other testimony before we get to the kids' song. So the kids can start getting ready to come forward. Have we got a kids' song lined up? Yes, we have. Elvis, last week I preached and we prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If there's anybody else who felt like something significant happened in their life, they're welcome to come and uh, share as well. But I know that Elvis was one of those guys who was touched. Oh, there's another shirt. Love it. Okay. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Guys, what does it sound like a funeral? Give, let's give us the joy energy, guys. Let's go. Hey. Give us that for worship. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, my name is Elvis. And uh, last week, right, I was standing there doing camera, since one of the youth wasn't able to. Uh, she, <laughs> right, I wasn't actually feeling myself that time. Although I was uh, smiling and all, I, have, I wasn't at peace. Although I was baptized so many times, uh, I was baptized by so many churches, by so many people, but I still wasn't at peace with myself. 
I still was still suffering with depression. I still wasn't thinking of if I was good enough until uh, Glenn was preaching uh, that, like, you should also be baptized by the Holy Spirit also, spiritually. Baptism, that sounded like, I said, like, okay, let me give it a go. Like what my sister says. Okay. So I was like, okay, let me try it. Let me try it. After the uh, church, after service, I went to Glenn, and then um, Glenn prayed for me, and then he helped me to at least have a connection with the Holy Spirit, and then I started speaking in tongues. And after that, I went home that day. I read my Bible, I started praying in tongues, and then the, the next day, my day was so peaceful. I found I was I was enjoyed the whole day, and it was actually incredible. I was at peace with myself. I even found, I was even found joy. I even, I even found joy in the bad situations of my life, and I even found a way to overcome them. And that showed to me that God is still really there for me. And I encourage all of you guys today to try your your level best to try and be baptized. Stay strong, guys. Cool. Thank you, Elvis. The joy of young energy, eh? We absolutely love it. But there's a life. It's not, it's not about the experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's what has it changed in his life. And I pray that you would just connect with the Spirit as God uh, moves amongst us this morning, as he does every time we gather. So we are going to have a kids song coming up. Can the kids come forward, all the children? And then it is the last morning of Kidsmen. You'll be uh, going out for that. No children in the house today? Okay. Come on, guys. There we go. If we can put on that song, I'm going to pray for the children before the song. So when the song is done, then they will go out with their teachers. Won't you join me, church? Let's pray a blessing over the youngsters. You're going to turn around when I finish praying for you and worship. Okay. There they come. Yo, I love that hair. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, Father. Father, we all started like this, even younger. We started in our mother's womb. We thank you for the child in Nicole's womb in the building as well today and Juliana and all of the other pregnancies uh, that we, we know of, patients as well, three that I know of and possibly more. But Father, we thank you for these young children that you have an appointment with them this morning. We are going to worship together and then as we hear the word in different ways, just in the different locations where we are, we know that your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, will be with as our counselor, our teacher, and the one who comes alongside. So we pray for great friendships to be built amongst these youngsters as they grow up together in this church and, uh, and launch out into the things that you've called them to, using their gifts at a young age already. So we just say, let their exuberance and their energy be contagious to us. In Jesus' name, we love them. Amen. This is a bit more Christmassy song, so everybody can stand and let's get into the Christmas spirit of Jesus.
You washed my sin away Oh, happy day, happy day I'll never be the same Happy day and oh happy day happy day you washed my sin away oh happy day happy day I'll never be the same oh happy day happy day you washed my sin away oh happy day happy day I'll never be the same Forever I am changed The greatest day in history Death has beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive Across the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive, is alive. Oh, and oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed. Last meeting face to face I am yours, Jesus, you are mine In this joy and perfect peace Earthly pain finally will cease Celebrate, Jesus is alive He's alive And oh, happy day In the way. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed.
Thank you, Lord. Let's go. <laughs> It's 
who I am and you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways do us and you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to me your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who I am, it's who I am. Where there was darkness, darkness now there is light where there was fear now there is love pain and now there is joy once the spirit now there is hope
made a way for us And we find it at the cross Oh, you're the God of the impossible One who's called faithful I was 
your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, He chases me down, fights the line, found, leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you gave it all away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm far Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you gave it all away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God beyond what's necessary it doesn't make sense it's careless and that's God's love for us that's how he pursues us with his love this morning recklessly every single one of you with a love beyond your own love for yourself he loves us way 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 more and father we thank you that uh, worship has done exactly what we asked it has prepared hearts for what you're going to do as Tony releases the word soon and Sue's felt a word for some people to be ministered to and we're just going to allow that the word to come and we know God will will orchestrate all of that as we land the service so father we thank you for an incredible time of worship this morning we feel like a good piece of meat that has been marinated and uh, just prepared and softened up by the love of a father by the absolutely incredible reckless love of a good good father every song we've sung the god of the impossible i know every different song is ministered to different people in their circumstances so we bless you for these musicians and how you placed the songs in their heart it wasn't by chance bless you father amen i'm gonna get through two announcements quickly so i can uh, if we can get the beautiful pulpit out for tony some strong men uh, the baskets are out for tithes and offerings if you haven't had a chance to bring them as part of your act of worship. But the first announcement is that straight after the service, so call it 10 minutes after we land the service, 
We're going to be going across to the Kidsman Hall, which is just the other side of the courtyard. And the elders will be gathering with anybody uh, who's visiting who's not yet part of the family officially. And you would like to consider that. Uh, many have been invited, but you are open even today just to pitch and come listen, and we can take it from there. All right, we will be a maximum of an hour just uh, sharing our heart, our vision, our values, who we are, what we believe, um, some of our craziness, but just simply who we are. Okay, so that's You Belong. Then after that is next week. Now we have a little bit of a difficulty in pushing forward. So everything that is on the program is going to happen. If you look there, 9 o'clock, we have a pre-service prayer meeting, the celebration, taking new members into fellowship, opening the Garden of Remembrance. Even if there's a little bit of drizzle, there is some sort of rain predicted. We trust it comes later next Sunday. And then water baptisms. Uh, please speak to Gerald or myself. We've got a few people who've signed up already. And then we will be having some form of lunch at 12. Now, the the lunch of the nations, where, as you've done before, where different people bring pots and we serve each other, whatever, we're feeling that might be a little bit reckless <laughs> in a negative way. Come, catch my train of thought here. We think that might be a little bit reckless. So we, we're going to change the format, but we have to eat together because something happens very special when we eat together. Okay. So at this stage, and we know Cyril's going to speak behind me tonight, Uncle Cyril, and maybe he's going to change the party. So we will finalize early in the new week and get back to you. But at this stage, it will take more the shape of a family picnic that you provide for your own family and you bring a little bit extra so you can share with somebody else. But we don't have as much of the, the cross, crossing over as we would want to do. Sad. You with me? Okay. And then some of the ladies, some of the guys will get together and maybe just provide something for those who forget, for the visitors who come and for those who are not able to provide for themselves. But we will eat in a safe way, in a responsible way. Is everybody with me with that one? Should we just cancel it all? No, just checking. Good. Okay. So those are the announcements for today. Then looking ahead to Christmas Day, remember... We have, uh, we're trusting then for an outdoor service. Even next week, we'd love to have done an outdoor, um, which lifts up the numbers, makes it safer, and all the rest. But uh, the weather might not play along. So we trust for a good Christmas morning service. And then reminder that we'll have two Sundays uh, where we will not have services, where we'll close and the staff will have a rest. And we will hit back on the 9th of January, 2022. Sounds like a nice 2022. Okay, so it's time for us to hear from one of the fathers in the house. Tony Peterson, can we encourage him? Can I just pray for Tony? Thank you for the rose. I really you know, think it's not for me. Won't you reach out your hands? I want to pray for Tony. Father, we thank you for this man who is a father in this house, has been for decades. Many, many men and women and families have, have received from him and Sue through the years wisdom, love, uh, acceptance. Uh, correction, whatever they would bring, but with love as a father in this house. So we pray for today that he has open heavens over him in his own heart, his own mind, his mouth. He would just release to us the truth of what you've revealed to him through your word in the book of Acts. So we thank you, Father, for the gift of Tony to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. How the body? The body good. They say one way to really get good with the language when you're learning a new language, you've got to use it straight away. So you've learned a bit of Creole this morning, so it's really great to hear the, the body good. What I've discovered though is just one of the things that, that happens, it's an anomaly, I don't understand it, when you get older, is that the same size shirt, they're making smaller. <laughs> I don't... It's, it's, it's stupid, man. Yeah? They make me say, no, the body not good. Or the, the, body, expand, the body expanding. <laughs> the body very good. Far too good. But it's a matter of perception, eh? And this morning, I believe that if you have ears to hear, God would break down strongholds, not necessarily demonic things. I'm not talking about there. there is, these, are, these are strongholds. And if you go and read in Scripture, when it speaks of breaking down strongholds, there are some mental strongholds that we have that need to be broken down. I think this morning that God is going to break down some strongholds. He's going to build other people's faith. He's going to encourage some people. He's going to offend some people. If you walk out of here offended, 
you actually have heard God. Hey, how can, how can that be? You're here to encourage us, not to offend us. No, that, if you're offended, that's God's business, not mine. Sorry, my hands are sweating. <laughs> so the title of this morning's message is, sorry, if we can go back to the previous one. Right at the bottom there, it says, you're not your own, belonging to God in an inhuman world. The title is not my own, it's borrowed from a book um, written by Alan Noble. Um, it's published by Intervarsity, of Vios, for those of you who love to read. I think it's a really great book. It'll help break down some strongholds and it'll help encourage. And what the title is telling us is that as followers of Jesus, we, do, we are not our own. We are not our own. And as not our own, in our belonging, as we go along, we belong to Jesus. In our belonging to Jesus, as we go about our daily lives, how does that thing then work? And what impact does that have, if anything, on an inhuman world? And it's an inhuman world. I call it an inhuman world because it has the tendency, the world and its systems has a tendency to take away your identity, to reduce your identity. It, it wears away at your identity little by little, just chips away at it gradually, gradually. Say, well, Tony, give me some evidence of that. Anybody have an Instagram account here? Why don't you put up your hand? Who has two Instagram accounts? Huh? <laughs> Kaya. So on a Monday morning, he goes to this Instagram account. On a Tuesday morning, he goes to that Instagram account because he's feeling better. <laughs> there is, there is a, there, there is, what, what's happening? Oh, okay. Let's have a look at the, your Facebook profile picture. What does it say about you? Hey, man, you got the big body. Huh? And you like to flash it. Why do we do that? Because it's the only way we can display perfection. That's my view of perfection. And where does this all come from? Is this, this is really so silly. Why do we do that? I mean, we do it all the time. We, 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 we one thing at home, we go, we, go to, we go to the gathering, we seem to be maybe a little bit different because those are just our insecurities. But the world has built on those things. My son's got a, a digital marketing agency and we often are at loggerheads because I say marketing is pure manipulation. He says, yes. Because it shows you a view of perfection. Now, if you drive this car and you have this body, you have arrived. And if you can shake the body even better, <laughs> it means something to somebody over there. <laughs> I have this little joke that I, I, I play with, with Sue every so often. I say to her, you know, Sue, one day when you die, the car park is going to be full of the people whose lives you have impacted and have come to mourn you. When I die, there will be a single taxi because that's about the only number of people I've impacted. <laughs> What's the problem? I mean, I, I think I laugh about it more than what Sue does. But what's, there's a fundamental problem with that particular joke. Because it's based on measurement. It's based on the, 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 the measurement of Sue's performance as a believer as opposed to mine. But if this thing is true, you are not your own, it means that the gospel has discriminated against me. How come Sue has a greater influence than me? Surely, the gospel has discriminated against me. Because we all belong to Jesus. So Jesus, why do you favor Sue? There's, there's a fundamental flaw in our thinking. So there are some, some mental strongholds that, that, that get stuck in our minds for some reason or other. And so where does that come from? Where does this whole 
performance evaluation thing, this, this hierarchy, hierarchical thinking, where does it come from? Well, if you went to school, that's where it started. That was the first public declaration of measurement. I remember at school, as a little primary school kid, being asked to read in class because I could read. And the teacher saying to some other little poor guy, I still remember, he was, a, no, I won't even describe him because he might actually find, hear me. <laughs> and she'd say to him, no, no, I don't want you to read because you can't read. We get to the end of the year, we do our exams, and man, I just get through. And the other guy flies through. So we, we, we're in this constantly, in this performance, it's built into us, this performance mentality. And we carry, and that thing carries over into all, every single area of our lives. Those people are doing better than us. And my little joke is, well, Sue's testimony is better than mine. The impact of the gospel is far greater in Sue than in me. But hold on, that doesn't, it, it can't be true. Because you see, the gospel is, is like this rose. When you look at the gospel, when you're presented with the gospel, it's a beautiful thing. It, has, it, it, it has, a, it has an amazing fragrance. If you can smell this rose, it has a fragrance. It, it impacts your life in a particular way, in a particular sense of your smell. When you look at it, the color is rich. The gospel is a rich, rich story, but a rich truth. When you look at this rose, this rose exists. Believe me, it exists. Yes, when you see the gospel, it is a beautiful thing. It is a multifaceted thing. You can sit and you, every day you can read the same verse and it can, God can highlight something totally different. When you see it, it is beautiful. And when you don't see it, it's still beautiful. So my little thing with Sue, the gospel has impacted her more than me is an absolute lie. I've allowed my perception that I've built up over the years of measurement that says, well, the gospel is more beautiful for Sue than for me because you, know, you can't really see it in me. And then for some of us, we say, this is what has happened to the gospel in me. This is a rose. But our perception is that the gospel in me it's dried up. It's not so pretty anymore. But actually, it's just as pretty. The gospel bears fruit. You go and read scripture. The gospel bears fruit wherever it, is, wherever it goes. It is a beautiful thing. It is always a beautiful thing. Whether I see it or not, in your life, as you go day to day, whether you are, have the opportunity to not have to go to a, um, a, a 9 to 5 or an 8 to 5, Eight to help us for job, or whether you have the privilege of actually being part of what God is doing, um, like Glenn and 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 what's her name again? It's Hoy. It's about like Hoy over here. They have they have, but that's a task that they've given them. They're not more worthy than Grant, who's got to go and lead a trade union. The labor, the labor guys, they're full of nonsense, man. Oh, dear, my, my, the, the YouTube is going to get cut here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good thing because they help balance out the capitalists, the greedy capitalists. Now I'm really going to get cut. But the gospel is still a beautiful thing. Whether I can almost see it visibly in your face, whether it's just something that had been hidden deep inside. Jeremy's testimony about that, was it Jeremy or Molly? I can't remember. The, the guy who, the Muslim guy, the father, who, who had years and years and years, years ago, 
You know, maybe his, his perception of the gospel was there. But the gospel, my friend, was exactly the same. It was exactly the same. So, how does, you know, this seem to be missing something a little bit. Because, I mean, there's Jeremy and Marlene's amazing testimony about how, how they're going out and the gospel is bearing fruit. The gospel is bearing fruit. It's an amazing thing. But for me, if I'm working in the spa as a teller, how does my testimony look? And it, does it look any different? Or is it of any less value than, than Jeremy and Marlene's testimony? The great thing about their testimony is it, 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 encourage, it encourages us. Because we see... The Acts, the beginning of Acts, and in fact, the whole story of Acts is still being unpacked every single day, and it's impacting lives all over the place. So how on earth does this work? If I can't, if I can't evaluate your testimony against mine and find mine wanting, how does it then work? How does it work? So here we go. God works in so many different ways with each and every one of us because we are we're just uniquely created. Some, some of you are activists. Others are, you're just quite happy with the status quo. You don't want to rock the boat. Whatever it is. The gospel is the, still the same gospel. It is just as beautiful whether you're an activist or whether you're a pacifist. It's still the same gospel. Whether you can see it or whether you don't, the gospel is still a beautiful thing. So how does it work? Our testimony comes in various shapes and sizes. And I'm going to give you three or four different, different kinds of testimonies. I want you to try and identify what is the unique thing in that testimony that makes it so amazing. And the first testimony, you're going to have to really look really, really hard because it doesn't look like it's a glorious thing. Okay, so we're going to start off. There's Acts. Okay. Today's passage is actually Acts 20, chapter 22 through to 20, chapter 24. And uh, we won't read them because it might just take a little bit long. But essentially what it is, is Paul testifying on numerous occasions because the people want to make the body no good. <laughs> you like the Creole? Am I, is my Creole okay? Jeremy, Pauline, cool. <laughs> Paul, if you want to see a little bit of what has happened to Paul, Paul in, in Acts chapter 9, he, Jesus encounters him. Boom. And he can't see anything. In chapter 9, you read where the guy is told, listen, you need to go and pray for that oak over there guy who's going around killing everybody, you need to go and pray for him because I won't show him how much he needs to suffer for this good, beautiful thing. Eesh, what a testimony, eh? What a testimony is Paul is setting up, being set up here. And at the same time, the guy puts his hands on Paul and Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Amazing. And he then, for years and years and years, about 20 years before you get to Acts chapter 22, he's, he is testifying and he is going around and he is taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. An amazing thing. And it is having an impact. He's establishing churches and he's putting in order things so that the people, God's people, God's, God's human sheep, are well looked after. That's what Paul's doing. That's what Acts is about. It's actually the establishment of Je Jesus establishing his church, starting it off over there. So that's the first testimony. Now the next testimony, we jump 1,600 years, 1,600 years. We can have that first little picture. 1,630 years, 1630, in Japan. 
Anybody know the history of Japan? Okay, so I can talk anything. You won't know. <laughs> no. Just trying to locate it. In 1630, the shogunate, the, the people who were governing, they decided that Christianity was a threat to their culture and it was going to westernize the Japanese culture. So they had to eradicate it. And what they did was they used some psychological um, torture. They used the conviction of the Christians to ferret them out. If you want to try and catch a mouse in your house, what do you do? You put out a bit of bait, huh? And what the shogunate would do is they would, they would use this, this trick. This thing over here is what is called a fumie. It's about that big, bronze plaque. It's got the image of Jesus, and they sometimes use the image of the Virgin Mary because there was quite a bit of Catholicism. They would then put that thing down, and to, to find out if you were a believer or not, and if you were a believer, you got body no good. What happened was they would, they would then force these, these people, who they even thought might be believers, they forced them to walk over that thing, to trample on it. At the beginning, the 1630s, there were 500,000 Christians in Japan. After 250 years of persecution, there were 20,000 left. And it is believed that those 20,000 were the 20,000 who walked on that fumie and didn't say that they deny Christ. Well, they said they denied Christ because they had to say, I deny Christ. But they knew in their hearts that as they trampled on this image of Jesus, all they were doing was confirming, Jesus, you died for me as I trample on you. All that, all that was happening is these, these, these vicious people were simply confirming the gospel in these, the hearts of these people. So 20,000... 20,000 of them survive, and it weren't for, if it weren't for those 20,000, the church in Japan wouldn't be where it is now. What an amazing testament, yeah? Imagine 1630, 1635, somebody, your friend walks on that thing, and you meet him the next day. What's his testimony? You traitor? How does that work? Because he walks on it and holds the treasure, that, that simple act of walking on this image, that image is not Jesus. That wicked governor is simply trying to use your conviction against you. And they understood that. They understood that. Nothing can separate from me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, even when I put my foot an image of Jesus. But there's something there that we need to grasp. Next one, we jump to, you can leave that one up, it's cool. We jump to 17, the 1700s, around about 17, uh, 1750. There's a guy by the name of John Woolman. Anybody know John Woolman? He was an abolitionist. He, he, he didn't believe, he believed slavery was a sin and worked to actually eradicate that. But he didn't wake up one, one, one morning and say, okay, I, be, don't be, I believe slavery is sin. I'm going to um, develop this, this strategy around the ministry that I'm going to have to actually uh, uh, abolish slavery. In his own words, if you're going to read his journals, he writes there, he says, he, he daily... He listened for the divine breathings. It's like old English, but basically what he's saying is he listened for the divine voices, conversations, and he allowed that to fashion and shape his convictions so that those, his conviction is naturally led into him actually starting to work against all these things that were happening in the world around him. And he was one of the key members in actually having, getting slavery abolished. We, we know William Wilberforce. You know, he, he's the big oak. But actually, John Woolman. But he's got, what, what it was, was, it, was a, the quiet power of a transformed life is so explosive that it can change 
the world. That quiet transformation in John Woolman was explosive to the point where slavery was abolished. He wasn't a loudmouth. But because of his conviction and because of what he started saying, he was ele elevated. The people started saying, okay, now we need, to, we need to listen to this guy. We need him to come and help us and to lead us in this thing. It wasn't his desire. It wasn't his strategy saying, this is my ministry. I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to get rid of slavery. So what is it in this guy? What is it in the, the Japanese Christians? Let's jump to the 14th of August, 1941. In one of the concentration camps, as very well known, Auschwitz, a young Polish priest does something rather interesting. What had happened was one of the prisoners in the, in the prison had escaped. And the Nazis decided they're going to take 10 prisoners, and by way of punishment and as a deterrent, they were going to actually, these guys, they were going to eradicate these guys, but they're going to do it by starvation and some torture. After three weeks, there's only four of those ten left. But one of them, this is an interesting thing, there were ten men. As they were being led away, one of them cries out in pain for his family. This Polish priest, Maximilian Kolb, Kolbe, hears it, hears the cry of this young Jewish man, and says to the Nazis, listen, let him go, I'll go in his place. They say, no, that's cool, we don't care who it is. So after three weeks, there's only four of them left. And the Nazis decide, no, this is ridiculous, and they kill them with a lethal injection of carbolic acid. What is it? Was it the compassion and mercy that this Polish priest had for that Jew, young Jewish man crying out in pain for his family? Yes and no. There was something else. There was there something else that Paul had? There was there something else that the Fumier Christians, guys, those guys who, who, who worked through that whole issue, it was there something in John Woolman's life. It was something in Maximilian Colby's life. And it's something in Anita who's a, who's, a, who's a teller at Spa in her life today. Her testimony is, this morning I went to work. And I, my shift was from 8 to half past 4, 8 to, to 5. I had enough time to eat. My testimony was, I gave the beauty of the gospel away, the fragrance of the, of the gospel, because... That's all she could actually pass on. The fragrance and the fragrance of the gospel was in the smile that she gave every single customer that came through. The gospel is the same gospel, same beautiful gospel. What's different? There's something else in Anita's life as well. So what is there? So today, Gerald. Learn more, Elvis, Joan. Is Joan here? Yeah. How does your testimony compare to Paul's and the Fumier Christians, John Woolman, Maximilian? Jeremy, sorry if I can use you or abuse you. How does your testimony compare to those? Friends, the comparison of the testimony of your life, if that is what we do, that we compare our testimony to the testimony of somebody else, is an insult to the gospel. Because the gospel is not performance orientated. It's not how well you can perform in what you're doing. There is something else. So then, how should we view our testimony? And this is the key in this whole thing. How should we view our testimony? Because all our testimonies are the fruit of the gospel. So Paul helps us, and it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9 and 10. In 
And here is a key. It's an important part. And if, we, if, you, if you grasp this, and this is maybe where there might be some shifts and where you, you might have a bit of a mental stronghold and you say, but hold on, there are other things here. There are some additional things, maybe. This is what it says. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians church. church. And he says, for I am the least of the apostles. That sounds like comparison, doesn't it? Eh? The least, if you are the least, that means somebody else is the, the greater. Surely. He says, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So his, his performance criteria is, well, they didn't persecute the church. I persecuted the church, so I must be the least of the apostles. Surely. I'm using a, my performance criteria is, you know, how many people we killed before I became, I followed Jesus. But he's an apostle, though. And he says, and this is the key. This is the key. But by the grace of God, I am who I am. I am what I am. He's an apostle because of the grace of God. If you're a believer here this morning, it is because of the grace of God. You remember Grant, when he preached, he said, the grace of God, what, is the grace, what does grace mean? It is, um, uh, uh, what did you say? Unmerited favor. What he's meaning is, it's free. It's free favor. If you're a believer here this morning, it is because of the free favor of God. And you are who you are because of the free favor of God. You are a believer because of the free favor of God. You did not have to do it. I am what I am. Paul is an apostle. He is what he is by the grace of God. Nothing that he has done. He was a persecutor of the church. He made sure people died because they were believers. And his grace, in other words, Jesus' grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Oh, again, it sounds like performance, man. You've got to work harder. He says that he worked harder. You've got to read further. If you stop there, you're going to have a problem. You're going to get into performance mentality. Because harder is performance orientated. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He can't get away from this grace in his life, this free favor, this free favor. Friend, your testimony is your testimony because of the free favor of God, not because some people are better at it than others. That's where we start. Okay, so what Paul is doing is he's leveling the testimony playground, playing field. Yeah? All the testimonies that I've related have the origin in the grace of God. If it doesn't have its origin in the grace of God, those people aren't believers. Because that's what Scripture says. You know? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul, he says, and in the second part of that, of uh, verse 10 says, and his grace toward me was not in vain. What does that mean? The grace that Jesus gave me, the free favor that God give, gave me, mean, he, he's saying, well, it, it wasn't in vain. It wasn't a fruitless, pointless thing. So the grace that Jesus has given you cannot be a fruitless, useless act. But you know what the problem is here? You know people who 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 who, who don't want to get married. And when you go and dig, it's because they're afraid of commitment. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> we should turn the, <laughs> You know, lots of these people don't want to get married because they don't want or they're afraid of the commitment. My friend, the truth, the truth requires commitment. That's what this means when Paul says, and his grace toward me was not in vain. My commitment, the truth comes to me, grace comes to me, and it's a commitment. And when the truth comes to me, there is a commitment to truth, which requires a response. He 
you know, this is becoming, no, uh, you know, you've just said, no, it's not performance orientated. No, that's not performance orientated. Truth comes and says, you know, can, can my free favor to you be in vain? In other words, I give it to you and it's, there is no response. The sweet fragrance of the gospel comes to you and me in its multifaceted form and its richness. And you say, ah, thank you very much. The body is good. So it's not performance orientated. It's a response to the free favor that we have in Jesus. Then he says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. So he's, oh, Paul, I think he's a bit, he's a bit uh, dung us in. Because yeah, he's worked harder than these guys. So he's deserving of, of this title of apostle. And nobody's, nobody's going to argue with him around that. So he works harder, but here is the thing. There's a qualifier. How does he work harder? He works harder because of his commitment to the truth. And it says, but the grace of God that is with me. I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. It's not me working harder. It's the grace of God working in me. My response as the gospel comes, as the beauty of the gospel comes, if we respond to it, if we are committed to the truth, what we do is we open our hearts and our lives to this influence, this amazing influence of the beauty of the gospel. It cleanses us. It's richness. It's just so, so, so deep. It impacts you deeply, multifaceted. There is nothing in your life where the gospel cannot come and influence. So from there, it is by the grace of God that we are saved. And those guys stepping on that Fumie stone or block, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No stepping on any block that is simply just an image. That's not Jesus. So I'm free from that thing. I don't know what my culture, what your culture may bring to you as a Fumie stone. Or for me a plaque. My friend, you cannot deny the gospel in that way. Even if you do, it is because as long as you remember, Lord Jesus, this is what the people did to you. And that what you're doing is you're allowing the gospel, the good news of Jesus taking away and dying for me to impact you and to influence who you're thinking and who you are. And it is that fragrance that starts spilling over into people's lives. But that's only a part of it. Let's have a look. I don't have the scripture, but Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Most of you, the majority of you will be able to quote that thing. And we, we quote it, A. Hey, because, why do, why do we quote it? This is what it says. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, yes, we love that. We love that, eh? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, we love that. You will be filled with power. Eey, I love it even more. And then we forget to emphasize the second part. It says, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The reason why I'm given power is that I might be a witness to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Jeremy and Marlene. That's what they're doing. Friends, the Holy Spirit wasn't given that we might have metaphysical experiences, that we might delight in the power of the Holy Spirit coming. And the Holy Spirit honors who He is. He comes. Whether you are enamored by the metaphysical or not. The Corinthian church was a mess. And God pours out His gifts. Not that we might start competing and saying, but this gift is higher than that one. And you say, yeah, but it's here. It's Paul writes there. He says, desire the higher gifts. Well, that's another thing. That's an, there's another conundrum over there, but let's not get involved in that. 
what Paul is doing when he writes to the Corinthians about those gifts, he's setting things in order and saying, okay, listen, guys, we, we, we all have different abilities. And, but because the Holy Spirit comes in power and because the church has developed in certain ways, we elevate certain gifts above others. Paul, the great apostle Paul, seems, sees himself as, on the one hand, he should be better than all the other apostles, but he sees himself as the least, simply because of his past. He was a persecutor. Can we have that last slide, the next slide? It says, everyone, now if we, if we look at the world, it's a description of this inhuman world. Everyone is on their own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression. So that at times, modern life feels like billions of people in the same room shouting their name so that everyone else knows they exist and who they are. It's a shout for, for uh, recognition, identity. But notice it says, everyone's on their own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression. My Facebook profile picture is an act of self-expression, saying who I am. And I'm trying to influence how you think of me. I might not do that consciously, but I've tripped and fallen into the trap. The gifts of the Spirit are not from my own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression. When you say, well, where do you get that? Well, have a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, you given power that you might be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Yes, we, we discover, and um, my, younger, my younger brother, Josh, where's he? Where's Josh? Is he here? Yeah. He did so well in unpack, unpacking the, the gifts of the Spirit. But if we stop with that, and if we focus on that, I'm, 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 I'm concerned that when I, when I hear some talking around the gifts of the Spirit, it's just a journey of self-discovery and self-expression on your own. That's not what it's about. It's about being part of the body, this body over here. And if you're just trying to develop your, your own ministry, your own gifting, you're on a journey of self-discovery and self-expression. It's not rooted in the gospel. Because the gospel says the value of that gift is when it is amongst all these people here. So, Gonna, I'm going to land very quickly so the chocks are, are, the flaps are down. We're going to land fast because it's been a long journey and it's been a bit of a, maybe a bit of a rough journey. So the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit was never given for us to empower ourselves on our own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression. We're given for the benefit of everybody else. That's what Paul's doing. He's saying, listen, guys, let me just put this in order. You guys are shouting, well, no, hold on, you know, I've got this gift, and I, you've got that gift. I've got, mine's more important than yours. Oh, man, chush. <laughs> He's saying, let's get it into order. Our lives have significance because of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Your testimony, does this let you off the hook? If you thought so, shame on you. Paul says, I worked harder than any of them. But it was the grace of God that worked with me. I worked harder. Sorry, it doesn't let you off the hook. What it does is it says, your testimony is as of great a value as Paul's. But the encouragement is, work harder. Why? Because so that the grace of Jesus may not be in vain. And there are many who are sitting here even this morning who the grace of Jesus is not in vain. Well done. Well done. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to live effective lives under grace. And our lives are designed under grace. Our lives are designed under grace. But we need to understand what it means once we receive the grace. And that's what I've tried to unpack this morning. Our lives are designed under grace to influence our workplace and our culture. When you live out the gospel, this beautiful gospel that has come to you in your, in your culture, you bring the fragrance. Paul, if you go and read Paul, Paul's 
You know, go and read his letters. Go and read Acts and see how he speaks to people. He's brilliant. You may say, yeah, but I don't have the mind of Paul. Yeah, but he worked. He did that because God had given him, under grace, he'd given him that thing and said, okay, Paul, I'm going to show you how much you've got to suffer over here. In fact, Paul, his testimony was some of the prophets had come to him and said, listen, you're going to, you, you, when you go to Jerusalem, they're going to bind you up. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to mess you up, eh? Body not going to be no good. Paul said, well, so? And many of us, what would you have prayed for Paul? Lord Jesus, show him that his thinking is wrong. Paul says, no, no, he's actually right. And it's uncomfortable. So our, how we see the grace of, of Jesus work out in our lives is some, sometimes some adjustments we need to bring. Because in that way, we can influence our workplace. We can influence culture. What Jeremy and Molina are doing is they're going and they're influencing the culture of certain people in their, in, amongst the Sierra Leones. And we celebrate that because we see the gospel, the good news, going to people who don't know it. We celebrate that. We're encouraged by, oh God, the gospel is still bearing fruit. Yes! I may not have, um, it may have, you know, the gospel had started looking like that in my life, but I see you're still doing the same thing. After 2,000 years, you're still doing it. Your gospel is still just as beautiful as it was 2,000 years ago. So this morning, the joy that the grace of God brings to you we understand the book of Acts, you will take joy and you'll make it joy to the nations. He's going to take joy. And I hear many of you, say, you refer to the church as joy. And that's great. But if I heard what Glenn has said, next year it's going to be joy to the nations. Have I got the gist of it right? <laughs> I don't know. Not in word, in action. Okay. The joy is still there. What a wonderful testimony that would be as God takes your joy, your gospel joy, and you take it out and it's just as fragrant to everybody else as it has been to you. Whether it is simply you giving a smile to people, whether it is going to another country and unpacking and equipping them, that is good. But it doesn't make your testimony less. Your testimony is just as significant because why? It took the same blood for that person to go to another country as it does for you to give a smile to the individual. Can we pray? Would you stand? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace to us, that free favor that you gave us. And uh, it's your decision as to who the free favor is given. We just thank you, Lord, that you gave your free favor to, free favor to us, that we might stand here. And maybe you standing here and you saying, Tony, I don't know what you're talking about. What's this free favor? Would you come and talk to me? I want to encourage you to do that. You can come and talk to me, speak to Anybody else who, who's been in joy to the nations or in joy here for a long time, they'll be able to help you understand what it means to accept this free favor of God. So we thank you for your free favor to us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your love, Father. We thank you for the grace, Jesus. And we delight in the companionship and the friendship, the companion of this, this regular day-by-day day companionship that we have with you, Holy Spirit, that we might be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We thank you for your presence, Lord. And I, try, I would ask, Lord, that your grace would continue and be very evident in the life of every single individual here this morning, tomorrow, the day after, the next week, the next week, months and years we have fulfilled your plans and purposes for our lives. 
Lord, may we bring glory to you in everything we do and say. Amen.